book of the prophet Joel chapter 2. If you found it, say amen. amen. All right. We started chapter 1 last time. This time we start from chapter 2. Amen. All right. Let's move on to, for, for the sake of time again, verse 20. We read from verse 20 down. Joel chapter 2, verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive them into the land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ale savor shall come up because he has done great things. 21 says, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. I thought I would hear amen. amen. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the trees bear her fruit. The fig tree, the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. In other words, in one month, we are receiving a double portion of anointing. The former rain, and then the latter rain. And what will that anointing cause? Verse 24. It says, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and all the fast shall overflow with wine and oil. 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dwelt wondrously with you he's dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed Amen. Let's look at Psalm 23. Isn't God good? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Listen to that. Green pastures. The pastures were dry before. But now it's green pastures. And he leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Hallelujah. For thou art with me. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil and my cup runneth over. The former rain and the latter rain, as they pour down, there is abundance and it causes our cup to run over. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. He says, surely 
goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For how long? Forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Blessed Father, we thank you for the pouring down of your rain. We thank you for the former rain that you gave moderately. But even so, you've added to it, Lord, the latter rain. And Lord, you've given it in abundance. And we thank you for the restoration. We bless your name, Lord. We thank you that our cups are running over. That goodness and mercy follows your children. And that, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have no fear for the enemy because you are with us. We bless your name this morning, Lord. Father, speak to us through your word. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, the word of God is sweet. Amen. Amen. His word is sweet. That's why the devil doesn't want us to read it. You may take your seats. God bless you. The devil doesn't want you feeding upon the word. Because he knows when you get into the word, you find yourself in there. Amen. And last Wednesday, we studied... We, we began these studies on the restoration. When God promised, according to the book of Joel, that he will restore. I love God. I love him so much. You see, because God never gives up on his own. As humans, sometimes when your children, they rebel and they err, they sin against you. And they blaspheme against you. Sometimes it gets to a point. I've heard a father tell their child. You are not my child anymore. I disown you. I don't want to ever see your face. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Because they are so angry. And so discontent. With the condition of their child. But instead of standing and hoping and believing and, and trusting that that child will come to correction, they give up on them. But not our Heavenly Father. Amen. When one person makes a mistake and leaves a flock of a hundred, he says that he leaves the 99 behind and he goes after that one that's gone astray. And he is the God who restores his children. Amen. That's what I love about him. He's not just a God of a second chance. He's not just a God of a third chance. But he's a God of another chance. Amen. As long as you are willing to repent, God will give you another chance. I can show you examples in the Bible. The scripture says that a righteous man will fall seven times. But every single time he shall rise up again. Because God continues to give you a chance. He made you to be an overcomer. A fighter. A winner. Though sometimes you have to cry. Sometimes you feel the pain. Sometimes you are set back. But still, because of the spirit of your father in you, Amen. you never give up. Amen. You have to get up and keep fighting. Amen. The prophet says, the devil says, boo, and you go back and you say, boo, boo. Amen. <laughs> no, like that little child when he's crying, he's being beaten and he punched and he's on the floor. And he's, he's actually being beat up. But he's crying and still gets up and continues to fight. Because of that spirit. I thank him for that precious Holy Spirit. But when we look in the Bible according to the book of the prophet Joel. We find that Israel natural, the nation of Israel. They had reached a point when they had left their God. Israel's biggest problem 
is that they spent 400, over 400, it's, it's about 430 years in Egypt. So about 10 generations of people who never lived on their promised land or never knew their God. Until God brought them a deliverer in the person of Moses. But when Moses comes on the scene, who was Moses? The prophet of God. The word of God always comes to the prophet. You watch this. And God sends the prophet to be the one who restores the word. And when Moses brings the word of God to them, the only way that they would gain their salvation or their freedom is for them to live according to the word or the preaching of Moses. And when they did, God delivered them from the hands of the enemy with a mighty strong hand. Moses' ministry was vindicated by the pillar of fire himself. And you find that when God delivers them, he brings them onto the wilderness. The wilderness was a place of trials and temptations. But as soon as they begin to get into a little hardship, they forgot God. All of a sudden, they want an idol. They replace him with an idol. And when Moses had left for a season to wait on God, they said, oh, Aaron, Moses has been gone for too long. Just make for us another God. They were lacking the virtues of the spirit. No patience. Immediately they moved on to another thing. I want to remind you that sometimes you may go through a season in your life where it seems as though God is silent or God is not with you or God does not listen to you but he listens to others or God is angry with you or maybe you are just not his child at all. I want you to understand all of that is part of the wilderness experience. Sometimes God is quiet because he's watching your reaction. He wants to see if you have faith in what he has already done. You remember in Exodus 14, God gets quiet on Moses the prophet. The prophet is waiting for the word of God. He's waiting for that say of the Lord. And God is quietly waiting on the prophet. Why was God quiet on Moses? Because God said, because I put my word in your mouth and I have made you a God. So why cry? You have to speak and move forward. And when you get into that time of silence in your life, it's not because God has abandoned you. But God wants you to speak. What are you supposed to speak? The word. When the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4 was tempted by the devil. The heavens did not open and you hear the voice of the father. Oh my son, I've defeated him. No. The Lord Jesus had to speak. But what did he say? It is written. You speak the word of God back to the devil in the silence of your situation. Say, so Satan, I know I'm not seeing visions and hearing an audible voice. But I have a word for you. It is written in my Bible that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And I have a testimony in this word. But you know, Israel did not do that. Soon as they could not hear from God, or they couldn't see Moses, 
they replace him with another God. We look in the Bible, we see Israel, so they had deserted God, and because of that, God will leave them into the hands of tormentors. Specifically in the time of the prophet Joel, the word of the Lord came to him. And God was warning him because Israel had left their God. They replaced him with another God. All of a sudden, all sacrifices had ceased. No more offerings in the house of the Lord. They have ignored going to church. I want to tell you believers, the moment you get into a position where you are comfortable staying away from church, is a dangerous spirit. Because when you come to the house of the Lord, at least you will hear one word that will bless your heart. One sentence at least. But the devil knows that too. So he will do everything he can to prevent you. You know, sometimes you wake up and you are so happy. Oh, I'm, I want to go to church. Just go hear the word. That is the day that the devil will bring the most devastating condition. And you feel like, I don't even want to go anymore. Why is he doing that? Because the devil knows what God has planned for you. See, it's sad that sometimes we believers don't know. The Bible tells us, I know the plans that I have for you. Amen. They are plans of good and not of evil, Amen. says the Lord. Amen. But the devil would put conditions to block you from God's plans. And sometimes we give in and we stay away. Especially now. Satan will give you all the reasons in the world. Oh, no, you can just stay home and you can, if whenever you get time, you can just go back and listen to the sermon again. Fresh food and stale food are not the same. <laughs> Fresh manna, yesterday's manna are not the same. The Bible tells us that when the manna came, that they were supposed to finish it on the same day. And when they left it overnight, it would be rotten and it had to be burned by fire. God does not want you feeding on stale food. God wants you to be feeding on spiritual food in due season. What God has for you has to be now. Consume it now. But Israel had fallen so short. God said they had become drunkards. They had reached a point in time in their lives. In verse 10 of Joel chapter 1. God says that the field had been wasted. The land was mourning, crying. Because the corn had been wasted. And the new wine had dried up. What is the new wine? I talked about it last Wednesday. What does the line wine represent in the Bible? The wine represents the stimulation of the Holy Spirit. But the wine had dried up. The fields have dried up. How do they produce the wine? From the fruits of the field. And if there is no fruit on the field, and the wine has dried out, that means there's no way to replace the wine. And what should it say is the oil languisheth. What does that mean? That oil represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
So the moment the children of God get away from their God, the word of God, their field become dry and desolate, unfruitful, and the next thing that happens is they no more have the anointing, and the next thing that happens is they no more have the gift of the Holy Spirit. But you know they are still rejoicing and they are still partying and they are still going about their lives. It is so sad that when God looks at the church of our generation, according to Revelation 3 from verse 18 down, he says that you say that you are rich. You say that I have need of nothing. But God said, thou art poor and wretched. You are naked and you don't even know it. See, the sad reality was that Israel was still prospering as a nation. But in the eyes of God, they had completely lost it. So then God sent them an army. If you are a true child of God, anytime you go wayward, God will send you an army. He will never leave you to enjoy the things of the world. Because that's not what you were created for. And God will make your life miserable until you return back to him. Yes. You know how sometimes the people of the world will be doing some stuff and they are enjoying and rejoicing. But you try to do it and then it turns evil for you. And somehow they are prospering in that. Because God created you of a different kind. The pig and the dove don't feed on the same thing. The vulture... And the eagle don't feed on the same thing. The eagle will have to only feed on fresh food. But the crow, the vulture, loves to feed on dead substances. And a lot of believers are associating themselves with vultures and crows and pigs. And those ones can feed on the mud and the dead things of the world. But you cannot. When you eat that, it makes you sink to the bone. Because you were made as an eagle. And you have the purity of a dove inside of you. A little thing goes inside of you and it throws you off for the whole day. Why? You are a child of God. And he will not leave you on the wrong path without bringing his correction to you. God will not allow you to perish in your sin because he created you as a child, as a son of God. He cares about you. It's the reason why he brought the destroyers according to the book of the prophet Joel. And when he did, what happened to them? I want us to look at what happens to them when God brings the destroyers to them. The Bible said, you read with me. Still on the book of the prophet, Joel. This is chapter one from verse four or maybe from verse three. It's amazing that God sent this and he gave them a message. Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children of it. So when God started.
a parable in Matthew 13, the parable of a sower. He says, a sower sowed by day and by night, another man came. How many remember that? What did he sow? He sowed the word. Right? The seed is the word, but then we find the people that comes out is what he likens to wheat and tares. So he's speaking about people. But in this particular passage, he's speaking about the nation Israel as a tree, as an olive tree. So because they did not listen to God, he sent them an army. An army of destroyers. And the first destroyer is known as the worm, the palmer worm. So I wanted to find out what the palmer worm does to a tree. You know, the palmer worm attacks the fruits of the tree. You find them hanging on the leaves and then they'll make their way into the fruits. And then sometimes the fruit looks beautiful on the outside. But you buy it home and then you cut it into two and then you find worms on the inside. Who ever seen that before? Get an orange or some apple or something. It looks all good on the outside. But then you cut it on the inside and you find that the fruit is corrupt. That is the work of this palmer worm. So we have a, a believers, a body of group of believers or a church that looks like they have fruits and everything is beautiful and it's prospering. But when God cuts them open on the inside, there are worms and corruption all over. Looking all flashy and nice on the outside. Everybody will see and glorify. Oh, wow, what a mega nice, beautiful looking, fruitful church. Look, they have everything a church is supposed to have. But then when he cuts it open, it will be like what the apostle Paul was speaking about the church of Corinth. He said, I have something against you. That the things that I hear from you guys are things that I don't even hear from the heathen. There is fornication amongst you. A young man is sleeping with a stepmom. And all kinds of things going on. But yet on the outside, you look like a beautiful church. And Paul, as a prophet, condemned them. And I wonder what God sees when he looks at, at us as a church. What God sees when he looks at the message today. When he sends a pure thing and the fruits are beautiful and the world sees, oh wow, holy people, you look all nice on the outside. But I wonder what God sees when he divides and passes this fruit into two. That was the work of the palmer worm. Now, what are the fruits that the palmer worm eats? Open to me. Open with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. Then we'll find the fruit. But the fruits of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, godliness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such is, there is no law. So this palmer worm, this great enemy that God has sent because the people have left God. When it attacks the bride, the church, the first thing that it begins to corrupt and destroy is the love. Go back to verse 22, brother. Love is the first virtue that we lose. Why is that? Because according to the teachings of our prophet, Peter teaches in 1 Peter 2 that love, perfect love, charity, is a capstone. It is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus says that the law and the prophets are all summed up in this one. 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your body, your mind, your soul. And the second one is like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfillment of all the laws. Love is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. That is why the Apostle Paul says, Though I have all the gifts, I speak in tongues, I prophesy, I do all of this and I have no love. I'm like what? A sounding or a tinkling cymbal. Making noise. There is nothing in there. The first thing the palmer worm attacking the fruits is the spirit of love. The fruit of the spirit is what? Love. That's why you see any church of God that has collapsed. It begins first by the devil removing the love. If I had enough time, I would have taken you into the book of Proverbs chapter 4. Because God speaks on certain six spirits that he hates. But he says the seventh spirit is an abomination unto me. And that seventh spirit is that spirit that brings division. How does that happen? The devil destroyed the love be between brethren. He destroys the fellowship. Someone that you used to love, but now you look at them and the only thing you feel on the inside is hatred, anger. This person just annoys me. It starts from there. And the moment you lose your love, you lose the joy. All of a sudden, you're no more happy to come to church. Because the love is gone and it goes away with the joy. And then you watch this, all of a sudden, you don't have peace in your heart anymore. You feel all so troubled. And then you become quickly triggered. No more long suffering. These things will happen in series. Every little thing will trigger you. And then you just keep on going. There is no more gentleness. You would have spoken and say, oh, God bless you, Shalom. And now you see those people, you can catch them out and move on. Why? Because gentleness is gone from you. There's no more goodness. You know, so the, the palmer worm, which is the spirit. Now, I'm, I'm going to tie this up because I need you to catch this spirit, what it does. The prophet of God tells us during the church ages and the seals that it is the same spirit that comes out as the white horse rider. I want us to, don't, don't lose this. So we understand as a church, when we begin to see some of these things come up, you know what the enemy is doing in your, in your midst. Amen. You begin to see these things. So in the church ages, God speaking to one of the churches, he says, thou has left your first love. You remember that? And then he tells them, go back to your first love. Back to whence you had fallen from. Because the first thing the palmer worm attacks is the love. And if you do not go back and refill your love for God, everything else will follow. The next thing that follows is joy. The next thing that follows is peace, long-suffering, godliness, gentleness, everything, faith, and then everything will follow through. Now the next thing you see is a believer who does not have none of these things. Turn with me to, to the book of Revelation chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 6 for the sake of time. You can read chapter 5, that's when the lamb upon the throne takes the book and he opens it. But chapter 6, when the book is open, I'm speaking of the seven sealed book. He said from verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four be saying, Come and see. He said, And I saw, and behold, a white 
horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. Remember, it's a bow, but no arrow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. That is the ministry of the palmer worm. Many did not see it. Just as a fruit that looks all beautiful, but the inside is gone. What did the prophet say in the church ages? Right after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down, the next thing is multitude of people join the church. Is that right? Mixed multitude. Then we find amongst them what is known as the Nicolaitan. And this Nicolaitan has got in and they are called the Nicolaitan spirit. That word Nicolaitan means to divide. Nico and Laitan. Laity means the people. Nicolaitan means to divide the people and to conquer them. The book of Acts tells us how that the first church, the first church after Pentecost was so united and filled with the power of God. Satan could never defeat, defeat them. As long as they were united under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So what he would do is to send wolves in sheep clothing. And they got in in the form of believers who called themselves Nicolaitans. They claimed to be theologians. They claimed to have been led by a man, St. Nicholas. Knowledgeable in the word. Then they started new doctrines. Nicolaitanism. That's how it started. And when you see these Nicolaitans, you see them in your Bible. It was an innocent movement. You would even call it, oh, it's just a sect of another believers. You know, we don't believe the same thing, but there's nothing wrong with that. Right? When you begin to see spirits start up in the message, you say, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. We, we don't believe the same thing. But I said, that's all right. Watch that Nicolaitan spirit. So the prophet of God tells us that Nicolaitan spirits, when they came in, then they started from a spirit into a doctrine. When the spirit is not stopped, it comes with its doctrines. Why is it a doctrine? Because you bear fruit when you are in the right doctrine. The word of God, when you feed it on it, and the Holy Spirit rain comes upon that seed, it grows and bears fruit. But when the devil destroys the pure seed, the pure word, you cannot bear fruit. And how he does that is with the Nicolaitan spirit. Divide and conquer. And they started with a doctrine that divides the people. So you watch them. The spirit has now become a doctrine. You find this in Revelation chapter 2 verse 15. In Revelation 2.15, this is God's message to the church age known as Pergamos. He says that, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing God says, I hate. So Nicolaitanism is how God started in the first church. And that's what we find. It went out as a white horse. Innocent. Nothing wrong with it. Can I just tell you believers. Not everything that looks good is godly. Let me repeat that again. Not everything dressed in white is an angel. Not everything that looks good is godly. Nicolaitans came in that way and it wasn't long before their spirit and their doctrine now it gained grounds 
And the next thing we see is that the Nicolaitans now have become first the deeds, next the doctrine. Then the main thing is they broke the ministry, they broke the church into fragments. If Look at verse 6 first before we get to verse 15. I want you to see the difference in how God identified those spirits. Verse 6, he says that, he says, And this thou hast, that thou hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You see that? That was the Ephesian church, the first church. The pure one. The devil could not destroy them. They hated the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. They would stand only for the pure word. But because the Nicolaitans joined themselves to the church, the next thing you find is there is Smyrna, the second church. Satan establishes his synagogue in a city of Smyrna. And the Nicolaitan spirit begin to spread. Then the next thing you find, by the time it gets to Pergamos, we move from Nicolaitan deeds, and then it becomes a Nicolaitan doctrine. You see that verse 15. So we've moved from deed, and now we've become what? Doctrine. The moment that spirit now has become the mainstream doctrine. Do you know what happened at that time? They started their own church. You know what they called it? The universal church. That's what the word Catholic means. Universal. <laughs> and that Nicolaitan spirit going out. Now began to destroy the original fruit of the spirit. But for the sake of time. We're just going to take time and go into the church ages and the seals again. But I want to just stay on, on, on what the prophet Joel was speaking about. After that, that, that palm worm. He's destroyed the fruit. And when they opened the fruit. And they would find that it's destroyed. The reading from Joel 1 verse 4 says that that which the palmer worm has, had left, right? So you imagine the tree. The fruits have been eaten off. But what is left on there now? A tree. Right? But can I ask you, what happens to a tree... When it is bearing no fruit. Turn with me. To the book of Mark chapter 11 verse 12. Mark chapter 11 verse 12. In fact, maybe you should go back a few verses. Because I want us to see what Jesus does. On this day, the Lord Jesus with his disciples... You know that they, they were traveling, yes, verse 11. Go back a few more. I want to get to when the Lord sees a fig tree does not bear in fruit. Okay, Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come. He went into Bethany with the twelve. And the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Right? And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves. So the fig tree has leaves. <laughs> right? If happily he might find anything. What is anything? Any fruit. 
on it. And when he came to it, he found no fruits, nothing, but what? Leaves. <laughs> For the time of fig was not yet. So you realize when the palm of worm, this, this fig tree was not even in this season of producing. Yet the Lord cursed it for it to die to the roots. You know that. What happens to the bride tree that is in this season, but the fruits have been eaten off or corrupted by the palm of worm? You tell me. The Lord Jesus said, I believe in John 14 or 15, he says that the tree that does not bear fruit, what will happen to it? I will cut it down. So the moment the palmer worm destroyed the fruit, the rest of the tree is completely gone. But the sad thing is, these worms never left the tree alone. Watch back in Joel 4, 1 verse 4. After the palmer worm destroyed the fruit, he says that which the palmer worm had left, which would be the leaves and the rest of the tree, what happens to it? Another worm jump on it. Because the devil was not done yet. He moves from a white horse. He only changes, he changes the horse. <laughs> but it's the same spirit riding it. The worm changes from palmer worm to a locust. What do the locusts feed on? The leaves. That which the palmer worm is left behind. They ate the fruit, they ate the leaves. What do these leaves represent? The prophet of God says that it represents fellowship. Those leaves represent a refreshment of fellowship. So after the fruit is eaten, let's remind ourselves, what are the fruits? Love, joy, peace, meekness, long-suffering, you know, all of these. After the devil is at them, the next thing is he eats off the fellowship. Now that a believer no more has love, peace, joy, meekness, godliness, they no more want to fellowship. Yeah. Now you are looking for them, you can't find them. <laughs> you call their phone, they cut the call. <laughs> you send a text, they block your number. <laughs> the devil kills the fellowship. Why? Because as long as there is constant fellowship with the word, Eventually to produce fruits. As long as the leaf is being refreshed by the latter rain and the former rain, eventually to bear fruit. So the devil has to continue and destroy the leaves, the fellowship. Do you see this in the church? When the devil destroys these things, then the next thing the person says, you know what, I'm not coming anymore. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. The fellowship. The leaves. So now, the locust continues off where the palmer worm left. I wish I had enough time to just go deeper into this. The Bible says never to, to forsake the gathering together of ourselves. Fellowship, never forsake it. But do you know why the devil... Destroys the fellowship. I just told you. Look at the book of Psalm. The very first chapter of the book of Psalm. I, I love to quote that. Because it tells us exactly why Satan does not want you coming to church. King David said, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seats of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in God's law does he meditate day and night. So Satan does not want you to meditate on the word of God. He does not want you hearing the word of God. And he does not want you certainly fellowshipping around the word of God. So he wants you to completely cut out church from your calendar. Gradual regression into the things of the world. 
And the reason why he, wants, he doesn't want you to do that is because of verse 3. If you continually feed on the word, here's what you become. You shall be like that tree planted by the river of water and you bring forth what? Fruits. He does not want you bringing forth fruits. He sent his messengers to destroy your fruits. So the next thing will be to destroy your fellowship. You see that? Because when you are in fellowship with God, you are like that tree planted by the rivers of many waters. Uh, the, the rivers of water. And then you bring forth the fruit in season. Right? Let me reread that so you understand. You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What's that water? The Lord Jesus says, I can give you to drink waters that, that you will never thirst again. There are many rivers, but all the same water. <laughs> There's only one water. That comes from the Lord Jesus. There are many gifts of the Spirit. All by one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13. But you watch here, he says, and he shall bring forth his fruit. I thought he was talking about a tree. Why does it say his and not its fruit? He's speaking that the fruit that you bring is not your fruit, but the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are bearing his fruit. When he sees the fig tree and it has no fruits on it, he was expecting his fruit on that tree. The fruits of the spirit. That's why it's his. The fruit of the spirit. The spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ. His fruit. His water. His fruits. Not your fruits. His fruits. In his season. That, does it say that? His season. <laughs> not your season. It's not speaking of spring or, 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 or winter or summer. He's speaking about his season. The season of righteousness. When a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, that is God's season. Every day is evergreen. Every day you are bearing fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't matter whether it's winter or not. A true child of God will still bear love, peace, joy, meekness, godliness, brotherly kindness. You continue to bear this fruit evergreen. All season long. And he says that his leaves shall not wither. And whatsoever he does, Shall prosper. Amen. This is why the devil has to destroy the leaves. So he destroys your fellowship. So now you are seated only in the council of the ungodly. See, but when you sit in the council of the ungodly, then verse 4 happens to you. The ungodly are not so, but they are like chaff. Which when the wind blows, it drives them away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. In other words, they will fail in the judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So you cannot sit in the congregation of the righteous and remain a sinner. Proverbs said that walk with fools and you become one. And I tell you the same thing. Walk with four wise men and you will become the fifth. Because birds of the same feathers will flock together. When you sit in the midst of all cold ice room, what happens to you? Sooner than later, you'll be frozen. you become ice yourself. The same way when you sit in fire, 
Sooner than later, you'll be set aflame and you'll be fire yourself. So the devil wants you to sit in the cold spirit and the cold anointing of the world. He does not want you to sit in a place where the Holy Spirit is burning. He wants to keep you away. Do you see it? So the locust destroys the leaves. But then the Bible still says in the same Joel chapter 1 verse 4 that the locust also leaves something behind. So now, palm worm destroy fruits, locusts destroy leaves. Then the next one, we find that that which they had left behind. Can I ask you, when the leaves are gone, what is left? We still have the branches. Is that right? Take me back to Joel chapter 1 verse 4. And then that which the locusts had left, there's another worm that jumps on it. His name is a canker worm. That word canker itself is not good, let alone the worm. So you see, progressively it's getting worse. Or I should say retrogressively. Because it's going backward. And it's getting worse. Watch the life of a person who backslides. They become worse than an unbeliever. That's that spirit. Palm worm. Then it, 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 it regresses to the locust. Now it's regressing to canker worm. That which the locust left. The leaves are corrupt now. It's left with the branches. So the prophet teaches us that these canker worms, they eat off the bark. Now, of the branches, the, the outside of it, they eat it off from there. They begin to bore holes all within. And the next thing you see is that whole branch is beginning to dry up. And he says, what does the bark represent? It represents a covering. It's a covering of the tree. Do you know what a covering is? The word religion means a covering. And it says that what this canker worm is doing is now is bringing them to a place where they completely lose their religion. So first they lost the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Next they lose fellowshipping with one another. Now they completely lose their faith in God. They reach a point where, where I, I don't even think this message is true. Not that they want to fellowship in the church anymore. No, but now they completely desert the message. I don't believe in this message anymore. I don't, in fact, I don't even know if God is even real. Well, all this Christianity and all these religions are the same. The next thing you know, now they are blaspheming against God. This is the work of the canker worm. You know what the Lord Jesus says about the branches? He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And any branch that does what stays in me, it will bear fruit. But when the canker worm corrupts the branch, the branch no more stays in the plant. It falls off. It dries out. They lost their faith. They lost their religion. Do you see why Paul says that if, if anyone, I, I believe that was, was it Paul or James, he says that if anyone redeems a person who had backslided, know that you have saved the soul. He says when you redeem a person from their, their, their uh, uh, backsliding state, know that you have saved the soul. So now they lost their religion. Then it takes you to the final stage. I can't elaborate too much for the sake of time because I'm about to close. It takes them to the final worm. After the canker worm, then the last of it comes. His name is a caterpillar. That one, it eats off the sap the life inside of the, the stem, the whole thing that's left, the sap, the middle of it. 
Now you see that that person that regressed first lost the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Then they lost the fellowship. No more desire to go to church. Then they lose their religion. They lose completely their faith in God. The next thing you hear, the devil completely killed them. The life is gone out of them. Completely dead. It's the work of the canker worm. These are the four stages of the devil's work in every ministry when Satan begins to destroy. That's how Satan destroyed churches. That's how he destroyed believers. But then we get to chapter 2. Then God, because the prophet said, because of Ephesians chapter 1. What do we find in Ephesians 1? predestination because of predestination God will not allow the devil to completely destroy and sink his church God said no but I will restore he sees that tree completely destroyed with worms all over it God said I will restore and how did he restore it he chopped off the whole rotten thing but then he caused a downpouring of his former rain and the latter rain. Then he causes the sun to begin to shine. Look at Matthew 5 verse 44 and 45. 45 says he causes the sun to shine on the just and on the unjust. What does the Bible say about you and I? When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ loved us. When the tree was completely corrupt, full of worms, yet he died for that tree, and yet he redeemed it. He caused his rain to pour down upon that tree. And the next thing we see, whosoever believe in him will not perish, but shall have everlasting life. That dead tree begins to spring forth. Little green branches coming off. Little green leaves begin to build up. It begins to grow again. Why? Because the latter rain has fallen. When did the latter rain fall? Look at Acts chapter 2. I want you to see this. We'll round up and close. I can't, I can't just unpack everything. Look at Acts chapter 2. So God watches nation Israel that is comparing to this tree. And how that, that tree had completely been destroyed. But when it was time, God's time and his season, he sent that rain. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 15. For the sake of time, I'll just go straight to the point. On the day of Pentecost, we've read about this many times and we've continued to read it. On that day of Pentecost, this is when Peter is speaking. When the people thought that the men in the upper room were drunk with wine. Is it not amazing? Hold on. That when prophet Joel prophesied, he said they had lost the wine and the oil. Do you, do you remember that? But when the Holy Spirit comes upon them in the upper room, the people on the street thought they were drinking with wine. You know why? Because the wine of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost had come. Peter said, these men are not drinking. He said, as you think, seeing it's only the third hour of the day. It's only about 9 a.m. But he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What did the prophet Joel say? He said, it will come, it shall come to pass. In the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. 
Did you hear that? Amen. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. Paul said, if you will seek any gift, I will advise that you seek after the gift of prophecy. Right. How many know that? Right. And right there it is. He says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's why we believe in a prophetic anointing. We believe in a prophetic ministry. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall do what? See visions. How many want to see visions? Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. If you want to see a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks in dreams too. The world teachers want you to think the only thing that demonstrates the Holy Spirit is just speaking in tongues. That's a lie. The prophecy of Joel says, it mentions what? Prophecy. It mentions what? Seeing visions. And then it mentions dreams. These are not all. We read the last time how that the Apostle Paul teaches about all the nine gifts of the Spirit. And even more now. He says, verse 19, and on my servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. You see that. What is God saying here? When he's restored the bright tree. We will begin to see miracle signs and wonders. We shall begin to see Mark 16. The things that I did. You shall do also. An even greater thing. You shall lay your hands on the sick. And they shall recover. You shall drink poison. But you would not die. So you shall cast out devils. That was God. Restoring. The bright tree. And you know what? When that tree was fully restored. The devil starts his work again. <laughs> starts destroying the tree all the way. Until God's time. Comes on the scene. Where he says behold I will send you Elijah the prophet. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. The hearts of the children to the fathers. Lest I come to destroy the earth with a curse. What was that ministry to do? To restore again. What are we learning here? The devil will always send his agents of destruction. It's a cycle. But God will also always send his agents of restoration. And God will bring back again. The former rain and the latter rain. And the moment that comes down, then the bright tree begins to bear fruits again. Did we see that? When God restored his word in his end times, all of a sudden we began to see the same miracles that the apostles did. We begin to see the vindication of the pillar of fire the same way Paul saw it on the road. And what is he doing now? We are beginning to see the same miracle signs and wonders right here in our midst. What does that tell you? God restoring his bride. Don't you see that? Now if you see that, then you also have to be aware. Anytime the tree bears fruit, 
it will attract the palmer worms. Many times we don't consider that. Soon as the church believers get to a place where we are manifesting love, peace, joy, all of the blessings, then it will attract the palmer worms. Because <laughs> the worms want to come and eat the fruits too. But you have to be aware so that you guard your spirit against these forces of darkness. Believers, do not let nothing destroy your love for God. Couples, husbands, wives, do not let nothing destroy your love for one another. Be bound together in the unity of love, bonds of love and peace. Do not allow the locusts to come in and eat up the leaves of fellowship. No matter how weak you feel, don't stay away. Come to a place where the latter rain is pouring. And be revived by the abundance of the word of God that you feed on. Staying away will not bring back the joy and the anointing. It will kill you even further. And when you come into the presence of the Lord. At least the word will be spoken. And it will quicken the spirit of God inside of you. It is a place of God's anointing. This is why David was able to say. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever and ever. Because he had this revelation. That as long as he dwells in the house of the Lord. He shall be like that tree. Planted by the rivers of many water. His fruits shall never wither. His leaves shall never wither. But it shall bear his fruits in his season. That should be you and I. And when we begin to bear that fruit. We can go back to Psalm 23. And say what King David said. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Just like a tree that's planted by the rivers of many waters. He restores my soul. See, once you were dried and cut off and not bearing fruits, but now that the latter rain is come, he restores our soul. And then he leads us in the path of what? Righteousness for his name's sake. You now see David's revelation. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, the funny thing is, it's not even death itself. It's just a shadow. <laughs> Sometimes you may see a scary shadow on the wall. Might look like maybe a huge dragon or like a big beast. <laughs> but the more closer you get to it, you discover this weak, wimpy-looking devil just standing there and using his hands to create all those shadows. Don't be scared by the shadows. <laughs> King David said, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. How is it that when your head is anointed with oil, it causes your cup to run over? 
Because the oil is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, it comes with a stimulation, the quickening power. That's the wine. The wine goes in the cup. The anointing comes on your head. But the wine goes in the cup. It causes the oil, the anointing, causes the stimulation, the quickening power to run over. That's what the Bible calls the zeal. That's why when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's like some power has come inside of you. That's what it is. Power, boldness. All of a sudden, you feel there's something just bubbling on the inside. He anointed your head, but then it caused your cup to run over. And he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How many pray that you dwell in the house of the Lord forever? That's my prayer. Lord, no matter how bad things get, never let me leave. No matter how many palmer worm or locust or canker worm or caterpillars will eat off the tree of the spirit. Lord, may I remain planted in your word. As long as you are still planted in the word, there shall be a restoration. And the Lord said, I will restore the years that they have eaten as we pray. I want you to look at your life. You know, sometimes things happen. You lose joy. You lose peace. Sometimes you even lose hope. Sometimes you don't really feel like coming to church anymore. And sometimes things offend your faith. I want you to know that's not God doing that. That's the devil who wants to keep you away from your blessings. If you want to be remembered in prayers, say, Lord, remember me. I don't want to lose my joy. I don't want to lose my faith. I don't want to lose my hope. Help me, Lord. So I pray with you. With all eyes closed, we pray. Just speak to the Lord. That he will give to us the former and the latter rain. And quicken his people, quicken his church once again. Precious Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hearing of your word. Father, we are so grateful that you are not just a God who forsakes and ignores his own when we fall short of the glory. But Lord, every time we fall short, you send your, your messengers of truth, Lord. And you, the good shepherd, you leave the 99 and you keep in search of us until you find us. And you restore us back into the sheepfold. Father Lord Jesus, we've heard your word. And the word has spoken and touched our hearts, Lord. And Lord, our hands are lifted up, Father, because we need you, O oh God. The devil has caused the conditions of believers to, to, to slowly get cold and lose the zeal, lose the love, lose the fellowship, lose a lot of things, Lord. It gets to a point where people don't want to come to church anymore. We've been reminded by your word. That is exactly how the devil gets in. Help us, Lord. May you restore your people, Father. King David one time prayed and said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I pray, O oh God, may you restore the joy of our salvation. You told them, Remember your first love and from whence you had fallen. I pray, O oh God, may you strengthen your children once again. If the devil has gotten a hold of anyone and is eating of the fruits of the spirit and eating of the leaves and the, the branches and destroying the tree of the Holy Spirit planted in the lives of your children. And Father, we rebuke that spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. We ask that, Father, oh God, you cause your rain to pour down upon your children. May, may the leaves of hope begin to come out and grow again. Let there be reassurance, oh God. 
Oh, may you bring back, oh God, the wax of justification and sanctification, the wax of Pentecost, Lord, the restoration of, of, of the, the gifts of the Spirit and fully, Lord, just fill your children with the Holy Spirit and seal us unto the day of, of our redemption. Bless this church, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done, Father. We know, Heavenly Father, that you love your children. If there's anyone who couldn't make it today, but they can hear, oh Lord, and they are listening and they feel like they lost their joy and things are not going right for them. I pray that thou precious Holy Spirit, the one who cares for your own, you will find them, bless them, restore them, revive them, Lord. We ask this, Heavenly Father, pour your rain of blessing upon this church, we ask. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen.